Ian Thomas, welcome to Talk To Me with Dave Ward. Thank you, Dave. I'm always really interested to find out people's backgrounds and how they got into music and sort of mm -hmm. where did you grow up and your first sort of experience with music? Well, music was always in the house because my mother was a pianist, church organist, organist harpist, uh, basically a show woman. I mean, if she wasn't, uh, if she hadn't been raised in such a ridiculously fundamentalist uh, sect, uh, she probably, you know, would have been like a Broadway musician or something, you know. Ethel Merman, she loved performance that much. So there was always music in the house. Uh, at the same time, there was always stupid British humor in the house, from old Peter Sellers recordings to the goons to uh, Peter Cook and Dudley Moore, who we were talking about a moment ago. So, uh, it, and it was always intellectually engaging because my dad was uh, a eth uh, medical ethicist and, uh, and philosophy professor. Um, so there were always wonderful concepts floating around at the same time, like Plato's insistence that there can be no absolutes on an imperfect planet occupied by really imperfect entities known as humans. So when you start getting into discussions like that at an early age, it starts opening the lid a little bit and the light starts coming in. In Toronto, you were in a folk group called Tranquility Bass. Yeah. So can you tell me a bit about sort of what instrument you first came to? Was it guitar? Was it piano? How did it start for you? First instrument was piano because my mother insisted uh, uh, that I have piano. Dave and I both have piano lessons, so we started piano lessons around six years of age. And uh, <clears throat> for me, uh, at, at camp one summer, I discovered a, a stringed instrument called the ukulele. And it's like, wow. You can sort of move around, go anywhere, and play little songs. And, and, you know, because my parents were Brits, we were sort of born and bred on George Formby. My dad had a lot of George Formby records, and he was bring da 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 He had a great sort of rhythmic solo approach to his ukulele banjo. There's one actually sitting up there. Uh, when I composed a score for the, uh, for the uh, it was for a Care Bears movie for Nelvana, the director... Uh, had this old ukulele banjo. He says, every time I move, it sits in the closet. It's been in my closet for about 40 years. Here, it's a great old steel ukulele banjo. But anyway, once I got into stringed instruments, of course, you discovered guitar, and then the Beatles hit. And um, I think that was probably, uh, because the music itself was so inspiring, I think that really woke a lot of people up. And a lot of people started buying guitars and writing and um, so the guitar was an easier instrument for some reason uh, for me to write on and I I loved a lot of early folk music before the Beatles happened you know there was an incredible folk music scene all over North America you know with the likes of Ian and Sylvia and, and Gordon Lightfoot and uh, these are just the big names Peter Paul and Mary but there was a whole underbelly of people who, Jesse Winchester, just a magical writer, that fellow. Um, <clears throat> you know, Sonny Terry and Brownie McGee, and they were all playing this folk circuit, and it had a social purpose to it in many respects. Bob Dylan's early uh, origins are in folk music, Joan Baez. These people were sort of the, the pioneers of the protest songs of Pete Seeger. I was a big Pete Seeger uh, fan, and how they were banned in the McCarthy era was uh, just for singing songs of protest. It was just such an obvious misstep um, as regarded, you know, free speech. So I saw that music could have a purpose, um, and then when I wrote my first song, I was hooked because um, I've always loved the writing more than anything. Um, in the writing, uh, it's as though the inner voice spits stuff up from my subconscious into my consciousness. And I sort of manage to work my way through, like a chow-chewing cud, I manage to work my way through what, what I'm sort of processing as I'm being bombarded with, with new stuff daily from the world and, uh, and from relationships. Uh, so it was always a way for me to work things out. 
what was the scene? Um, was the Toronto? What were the gigs like in the beginning? What kind of shows did you start playing? Well, initially they were like uh, uh, folk clubs, coffee houses, and you you know university pubs. And I started out with just as a duo with with Nora Hutchinson, a girl I sang with. You know, much like Ian and Sylvia, we were doing all of those twofers. Uh, and then we added a, a third, uh, we became a trio, and then we added a bass player. And then uh, as soon as I was out of grade 13, um, uh, I wanted to go to university, but uh, I signed with RCA. Like I signed personally with RCA, and they said, we, we, you know, you can certainly use your band, but we're interested in you uh, as an artist. So um, I thought, all right, I'll try this for a couple of years. And uh, so here I am at 68. I've yet to go to university. Um, so it's been just an amazing, uh, and all I've ever done is just followed my interest. And um, it's just been an amazing run. So I believe that you had a, you had a stint in uh, CBC Radio for a while before Ian Thomas Band. Yes, I did. Um, my wife was pregnant. Uh, I was playing bars and uh, had already been reduced to cover tunes. Uh, so as a writer, it was just a dead end. Uh, so I left the band and uh, I went to see a friend at, well, he was a, a guy I had met who, uh, my band had done a live, done live recordings with CBC, for CBC, with the Toronto Symphony Orchestra. A uh, couple of, you know, Christmas celebration and we did a uh, quite a serious piece of music uh, written for a band and orchestra by Stephen Gelman called The Odyssey. Uh, and there was a producer by the name of David Bird who did one of the popular music shows for me and I went to see David and I was desperate at this point. Uh, Catherine was uh, five months pregnant and I said, David, I, I'm looking for a job. I'll start off in engineering. Uh, Assistant, producer, gopher, anything. I need, he said, well, Ian, uh, I think you should be a producer. Uh, you know, I mean, I just listened to your uh, Tranquility Bass record a while ago. He said, that sounded just marvelous. Did you produce that? And I said, actually, no. A guy named Bill Meisner did. Um, but I think I, I think I can produce. I'll play you my demos. And uh, I played him my demos. And he said, you got more background than a lot of guys that are producing music. And they had just opened uh, a thing called the Transcription Recording Service that, uh, or were trying to put more emphasis on it. Bill Bessie was the head of that, where you would make transcription recordings that could be sent all around the world to all the CBC outlets. Um, so I went to uh, the big audition chat with everybody and um, the motivating question came from uh, the head of radio, a guy by the name of Bob Wagstaff, who said, so what, you, what makes you think you're so good that you can do this job? And I said, I think it's my ears. I don't think it has anything, I don't think this job has anything to do with education. If you're producing a piece of music, it's up to you to make sure it's balanced properly, that you're giving the public a good rendition of what was heard, and I think that all comes down to how good your ears are. And which I think is probably the reason a great number of engineers are better producers than the producers. Um, so I got that job and for two years, uh, two and a half years maybe, uh, before Painted Ladies hit, I was writing at night still, because I'm a writer, it's what you do. Whether you have, a, whether you have an outlet for your songs or not, you write. Uh, it's, it's as much an affliction as it is a talent, I think. So in that window, I wrote my first album. Uh, I produced a lot of records uh, for, for the CBC Recording Service. And I learned a lot when I was producing big band jazz. Uh, I picked Gene Krupa up at the airport. And he was carrying what looked like the Dead Sea Scrolls. And these were all of the original charts of his for Begin the Begin and A Train and all this stuff. And we rehearsed at the Glen Gould Theater uh, with Toronto Brass, which were superb in that day, in those days, Arnie Tchaikovsky and 
Toth Brothers and Teddy Roderman on, on trombone and uh, Rob McConnell on trombone and just unbelievable players. Uh, Doug Thompson on, on bass, Terry Clark on drums. Just so Toronto had a really well-respected uh, brass and reed reputation. And I heard these charts and I realized, wow, this is the rock and roll of its time. There was no amplification, it was just powerful and it was great. And Gene was just such a gentleman. And I, you know, at that point in time, I was just, oh, if I heard another big band jazz tune on CBC, I was going to hurl. But I really came to love it through listening to Gene and meeting him and, and then having to produce this and get this on recorded well. And uh, it was pretty amazing. And did a live show with Ray Charles. And boy, there was another interesting. I even produced Quincy Jones. Quincy. <laughs> I produced Michael Jackson's producer. <laughs> Quincy came up, uh, brought with him a, a group of wonderful mus musicians. He happened to bring up my favorite piano player by the name of Dave Grusin. Dave Grusin did the score for On Golden Pond. He also was the guy who had the kahunas to do an entire score for piano on the film The Firm, that Tom Cruise film. It's all piano. Um, and just the loveliest guy. So Quincy came up with him and Ray Brown on bass, who was one of the all time, my all time favorite upright bass players. Uh, Grady Tate and Phil Upchurch, and then we filled it in with Mo Kaufman and a whole pile of the, the Toronto uh, brass, et cetera. And he, actually he brought up Peggy Lipton, who was living with from, who was a star on uh, a TV show at the time, The Mod Squad, I guess. And, uh, <clears throat> she did some background singing. Anyway, it was a real interesting um, uh, evening and it was a real interesting look at some of the world's uh, best musicians that he brought along. And of course, it all went on into a crappy eight track machine, a scully that that's all uh, CBC could afford. So there really wasn't much of a chance to, to do much mixing. But uh, it was real, a real interesting. I produced Nina Simone, I, uh, Dizzy Gillespie, and Jimmy Smith down in New Orleans. Uh, I was lucky to get out of that gig alive. And um, so, yeah, it was an education like no other. And so, what's, um, at what point then was the, the music starting to bubble up again? Pain and Ladies, that album. Can you explain <clears throat> how that came about? Well, when you. I was producing other artists and they were frustrating me. Um, and, you know, because I, I felt I was an artist. And, and uh, I loved giving everything I had to them, don't get me wrong, and I, and I developed some strong friendships with some of them. And I really respected what, uh, what some of them did. There were, I, I came across a few really good writers. Um, <clears throat> so it was this frustration, it was like a spring that was coiled. So I just started writing my ass off. And uh, soon I had enough for the first album. And I, uh, I thought, well, what the hell, I'll start shopping around, see if anybody's interested in doing an album with me. And of course, in those days, uh, much like it's come full circle, um, the A&R departments in Canadian record companies were window dressing. Uh, there was no real money to record Canadian artists. It was sort of all part of their commitment to getting the right to distribute records in Canada. Oh, yes, of course, we'll be investing in Canadian talent. Well, we all know how that goes with all of, we were talking about this earlier, how all the conglomerates have promised the CR to see the great thing they're going to do for local programming, and they just gut the stations and gut all the local programming, and it's, it's pathetic. Um, but it was uh, a time where I went, you know, Warner Brothers, oh, we're excited. We, you know, yeah, we really want to work with you. And, and uh, then when the actual paper came down, it was, they wanted to do a single. They wanted to, they wanted to record two songs. And uh, so I just thought, well, that's not much investment in me as an artist. You've been wasting my time. So 
Finally, I, I went to a guy named Ross Reynolds who loved every song, on, uh, and I had done them all on an old Sony sound on sound machine, a TC630, I think they were called. And uh, he uh, had just started GRT Records. And GRT was a, a real mover in Canada. Dan Hill was there, and uh, oh my gosh, he started getting all kinds of... He had Year of the Cat, he had, so yeah, had Al Stewart. He started signing for Canadian distribution, all kinds of international acts, because they were just so great. They were a wonderful label. And uh, so when Painted Ladies hit, uh, I thought, well, I can't really still be a CBC producer. Uh, so I quit. I, I went over to England and started on my second album. And uh, I've been at it ever since. When you had sort of just hit with Painted Ladies, what were, what were the types of shows you were playing? Did things really pick up and change for you at that point? <clears throat> well, I did a, a debut concert with the Hamilton Philharmonic for the second act anyway. Um, I, played, I played a lot of bars, a lot of festivals, bars. Um, and in Canada, and I did, I did an opening act, uh, maritime tour, uh, opening for April Wine at Miles Goodwin, who we've become good friends over the years. Uh, so you do the Cross Canadas, you know. You, I went across the country with the Stampeders. Uh, I think the Stampeders actually was the first act to do a major arena tour. They even had their own guys shimmying up the poles to tap into the transformers to get the power for the lights. Because there were, there were, the facilities just were not used to, uh, you know, they just put limited lights on and, you know, the speakers for the announcers in those places were, I mean, I can remember doing a ballad and in the middle of the ballad in the prairies, it was a tin roof and there was a hailstorm and it was just hysterical <laughs> playing in the prairies during a, a hailstorm. But the cost of playing in Canada was just like stupid. So you could lose your shirt. You know, once you hit the prairies, then you have to travel the distance and there isn't the venues on the way, right? That's right. You know, when I was talking to Rick Emmett about that. When Triumph, in their heydays, they had just finished this ridiculously profitable U.S. tour and they were really pumped and they thought, all right, let's take this to Canada. And they went across Canada and, and Rick said, you know, we we're real close to losing our shirts. And so it was, you know, in the U.S., the travel was, you know, an hour to the next venue and you know, boom, you pack them all in again. And uh, so I thought that was a really interesting kind of upfront take on, well, there it is in a nutshell. If you, if you want to perform in Canada, it's a, it's a costly endeavor. Can you tell me, uh, can you tell me two things? What was the, the fastest, quickest song ever came out of you? And then maybe a song that you toiled and wrestled with. Hmm. What's, that's an interesting discussion because it's it, basically it's a discussion of inspiration versus technique um, or will. You know, you're going to will a song to sound a certain way and sometimes no, 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 it's not going to go that way. Uh, <clears throat> right Before Your Eyes, uh, which was a ballad of mine uh, and then America did a cover of it. Um, it served me quite well as a songwriter financially. Uh, but I felt rather guilty claiming to be the author of that uh, because it appeared lock, stock, and barrel in about 15 minutes. Um, <clears throat> and I've spoken to a number of writers about this. We were all over at Tom Cochran's house one night for dinner. So it was myself and Murray McLaughlin, Mark Jordan, and Tommy, and we, Alan Fru from Glass Tiger, and uh, Amy Skye, of course, and uh, a great West uh, BC writer by the name of Annette Descharmes, a wonderful writer. Um, and everybody fessed up to having a handful of songs they really didn't feel they wrote. They were sort of handed to you. Now, that's a pretty humbling thing, really. Um, you realize you're tapping into something that's greater than yourself, and, and for some reason it all comes out in a moment of clarity. It's like that Inuit soapstone carving analogy of releasing the figure trapped in the stone. I think as applied to songwriting, the stone is your head. On any day, your head can be your own worst enemy. On other days, the muscles can relax enough to let the incoming come through freely. 
So those are those songs. And then on the other hand, and those were usually, <clears throat> I would have to say most of my hits came fairly quickly. Um, you know, Pilot, Coming Home. Uh, actually, I had to work the, the chord structure out uh, on Pilot because it's it 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 noodles in and out of major and minor a lot. That song, it's a really bizarre song. So I had to figure that. I heard it all in my head, uh, and then I actually had to okay, what am I actually hearing? And then I had to figure all of that out. So there was some technical um, time spent on that. But it was just really, uh, even that didn't take that long because I could hear it in my head so I could grab it, you know. Uh, any of the songs that I, I labored over usually sounded labored over. And uh, you, it's that scenario to go back to the soapstone carving analogy of uh, taking too much off and, or in the music thing, putting too much in. I'm always really curious about families that have, you know, children that are either both athletes or they're both in show business and entertainment. So, so your household must have been an interesting place. It was. It was alive with music and, as I said, the stupid comedy of Sellers and all that stuff. And Dave, at a very young age, uh, he'd leave the dinner table while we had guests and he'd come back and be a... Uh, uh, a vacuum cleaner salesman and you know he would be maybe in a Peter Sellers mold he would uh, like he was in the film The Doctor or something he, he came in as a Pakistani uh, vacuum cleaners salesman because the dialect is just so much fun to articulate as it was for Peter Sellers and he did it so well I think even in the moody movie The Party you know Howdy Partner and <laughs> Woo Birdie Num Nums and uh, I mean, he had he loved playing with dialects, and so from an early age, Dave and I loved playing with dialects, because we'd go over to Britain, so we'd be in Wales, so we'd well, how are you, boy? Oh, not bad, boy, Bach. We'd get into the whole Welsh thing, and then we go up to Scotland to my mother's people, and he's oh, how do you? Oh, I'm no bad as yourself, you know, and into that whole thing. And I love, you know, knowing you of Irish, I love uh, underneath, underneath. Instead of underneath, it's underneath. You know, you get up into the north of, of Ireland. And, and uh, I had an Irish geography teacher who called me Tarmus. The tone always goes up at the end. And the R's yeah. that you, you implant into names like Thomas. What's the answer to that, Tarmus? <laughs> <You know? laughs> so I have always loved uh, the mimicry of, uh, of dialects. And, and then when we lived in the south, um, you know, we lived in North Carolina where people spoke real slow because it was so hot out. And, you know, it was just, it's just been great fun. And so all of that stuff spun David into, and my dad was a, uh, initially a Baptist minister, but had too many questions to stay in the pulpit, so became a philosophy professor. But we watched him perform, and we watched my mother perform. And so... Uh, it seemed like, oh, I guess that's what we're supposed to do. So we both headed into, into show business. And um, at young ages, geez, when I was at CBC, I gave Dave one of his first writing jobs. I hired him, him and Eugene Levy, to, to I had a two-hour block called the National Rockworks Company. And it had comedy inserts. And one of them was a thing at the end of the show. It was called End Table. And it was a panel discussion on how to end the show every week. And it was Dave and Eugene and another uh, Second City alumnus by the name of Don Dickinson. And it was just, uh, they were just fantastic. So it was always a, um, watching Dave grow in the Second City school, you know, from being, you know, a guy who was an obvious amateur to within a year, uh, you'd go in and in the improvs, he'd just lay you out. When he and John Candy would get going, it was just uh, a joy to behold. So us ending up in, uh, in different branches of show business, uh, it's really all of our parents' fault. And my mother in particular, who said, you can do anything you set your mind to. And 
that means that both David and I have tried to do things we had no business trying as well, because we just believe we could do anything. What have you learned over the years as a storyteller about people and about yourself? Oh, I think, yeah, my God. I think for the most part, you realize you're the master of your own imperfections, and that's, a, that's about it, you know? Um, I think I've learned a lot more about the subjectivity of art, of all art. There are going to be people who are going to love your work. There are going to be people who hate it. And a vast number in between who could really care less one way or the other. And that's the way of things. When you're young, you can walk off in a harumph uh, because maybe you feel your work hasn't really been given its due. And uh, you come to realize that none of us are owed anything. The joy is in the creation of the art. And if you want to strap that to the wheels of commerce, uh, you've already ruined the art. If that's your motivation, if your motivation is strapping it to the wheels of commerce. Um, the thing that has kept me going all my life is this internal creative force that just likes to create. I like to make stuff, be it songs or my books or film scores. Um, that, is the, that is my joy. Ian Thomas, thanks so much for coming on the show. My pleasure, Dave.